Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Very well, indeed. Thank you. I think we should begin the webinar now. So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ari Chavez and uh, I am in the communications team at Karandas. I will be your host today and I welcome you all to this webinar on the financial inclusion insights, Pakistan survey findings on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on financial behavior. Uh, the report focuses on the findings of the COVID-19 panel survey implemented from October 20th to December 30th, 2020 uh, to measure changes in financial inclusion compared to the FII wave six survey implemented from February 18th to March 22nd, 2020. Uh, today's event will begin with welcome remarks from Mr. Vakasul Hassan, CEO Karindas, followed by opening remarks by Mr. Salim Raza, member of board of directors at Karindas. Uh, we will then be having an address by Mr. Suhail Jawad, director payment system department at the State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, we will then move on to a presentation on the survey findings by Dr. Samuel Shweth, Research Director at Kantar. Uh, the floor will then open for a question and answer session for about 10 minutes. Uh, you're all requested to type in your questions uh, in the Q&A section uh, so that I may pass them on to the presenter. In the end, we will have a panel discussion which will be moderated by Ms. Meher Shah, Director Knowledge Management and Communications Department at Karandas Pakistan and Mr. Ali Akbar, Manager Knowledge Management Team at Karandas. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to request Mr. Vakasul Hassan to please say a few words on the survey. Uh, Mr. Hassan is the CEO of Karandas Pakistan and has a vast experience of designing and managing private and financial sector programs. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, Mr. Vakasul Hassan. Sir, if you kindly could switch on your camera and your mic. Uh, Reej as host, I think you have to permit. You have to. All right, sir. Just a second. I will just be updating that. Thank you, Arish. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly, Vakas. Yes, quite clearly. Thank you very much. It's, it's a great pleasure in welcoming all of you to this event. Uh, I have been working with Karandas for a long time, but this is the working for Karandas, and this is the first event uh, that we are hosting since I started, so quite special for me. Uh, I've seen the results of this Survey. These are indeed uh, unprecedented times, and the findings show how much and how quickly the world has changed around us in the last one year and is still changing. Uh, before I speak uh, on the subject for today, I would like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Naza, Director Karandas, Mr. Suhail Wajid uh, from State Bank of Pakistan for taking time out to participate in this webinar and address the audience. Uh, State Bank is a great partner in many of our uh, ventures with us. I would also like to thank Dr. Samuel, Director of Research at Kantar, and all the panelists for their participation, and look forward to hearing their thoughts on the implications of the survey findings for Pakistan, financial inclusion, and the digital financial ecosystem. Karandas, as we all know, is all about financial inclusion of individual and firms, individuals and firms, and that's the financial inclusion with a purpose, with the purpose to create jobs and raise incomes of the poor. We have to find innovative ways to push the frontiers of financial inclusion and hence knowledge creation to find for finding such ways and understanding the ecosystem is an integral part of Karanda's mandate to promote financial inclusion in the country. With assistance from the Bill and Melinda Gain Foundation, the Financial Inclusion Insight Survey, the FII in short, was launched in 2013 in eight countries, of which Pakistan was one. 
conducted six times since then. It provides a valuable source of demand side data, supplemented with supply side statistics. We believe the FII provides a valuable and powerful source of guidance for Pakistan to benchmark itself in its journey towards financial inclusion. Karandas joins hands with Kantar to conduct the sixth wave of FII survey in Pakistan. That survey was conducted in the first quarter of last year, 2020. Since then, our world has changed in dramatic and unprecedented ways as the COVID-19 pandemic has gripped country after country. As anecdotal evidence surfaced, another survey exercise was launched in the fourth quarter, this time to assess the impact of the pandemic on financial behavior in Pakistan. Today's webinar has been organized to present the findings of this latter survey and also to think about our next steps. So some of the key questions which would be explored by panelists today are, which of the major impacts of the pandemic are likely to stick and will result in sustained changes in the financial behavior of clients? How would the past post-pandemic financial landscape look like? How should financial institutions gear up to meet this post-pandemic world? And as we all know, this is not unique to financial industry only. Business models across different sectors and across the globe are changing. What are the implications for women, for young people, for the low income? And how do we ensure that digital finance does not deepen the digital divide? And last but not least, why is it important to collect and generate demand side data? As an old timer, I recall a time only a decade ago that when designing the financial inclusion program, only counting the numbers of people connected or served by financial sector was considered a success. But then the debate moved on to quality and affordability of this connection and the impact it was creating, or then it should be creating on the lives of the clients. The metrics proposed by the G20's Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion promote the tracking of access and utilization of financial inclusion. With robust demand side data, we aim to continue adding an important layer to the discourse, coupling not only provision and utilization, but also other demand side metrics such as capacity and willingness of the unbanked and underbanked to be financially included. Our hope is that access to multidimensional data can help policymakers, regulators, and institutions in creating a richer understanding of the challenges and opportunities. At the end, I would once again like to thank all the speakers and participants for joining this webinar. And I hope today will prove to be a good learning opportunity for all of us as we discuss the learnings from this important survey. Thank you. Thank you, Vakas. Um, thank you for your input on the service impact and uh, highlighting Karantaz's role in the process. I would now like to request Mr. Salim Raza to please, please share his thoughts on the survey. Um, Mr. Raza is the member of Board of Directors at Karantaz Pakistan. He has a broad-based career in banking and financial sector, spanning over 40 years. Uh, Mr. Raza has held the position of the 15th Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan and has also been the CEO of Pakistan Business Council. In 2018, Mr. Saleem Raza was appointed to the Prime Minister's uh, Pakistan's Economic Advisory Council as a member representing private sector. He is currently a member of the Economic Advisory Council of the Government of Pakistan. Mr. Saleem Raza, ladies and gentlemen. Sir, if you could kindly switch on your uh, mic and your video. Thank you very much. You, you have just uh, uh, unshackled me from, from being muted and uh, absent. Uh, in terms of um, appearance. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to discuss the results uh, of a survey carried out by Cantor Management Consultants, and uh, you know we look forward to their confirmation of uh, <clears throat> uh, a number of impressions uh, that we have, but they will tangify it, uh, ground it, and uh, give us a, a clearer, a firmer idea of <clears throat> the success of everything that's happened so far and prospects for all the uh, initiatives that are now at hand in terms of their future uh, implications. Now, <laughs> as you know, the COVID impact actually has taken its place as one of the uh, biggest uh, economic shocks of the last hundred years. 
100 years, which includes the Great Depression and the financial crisis of 2008. So the impact of, of uh, COVID is estimated globally to have uh, led to a contraction of four and a half trillion, four and a half percent in the global GDP, which is about almost four trillion dollars. Um, 255 million working hours were lost, and uh, which amounted to a loss of 3.7 trillion dollars in workers' income, uh, income of workers around the globe. Um, in Pakistan, though, the effect was milder than it has been in a number of countries. The economy contracted by about half a percent. The government's estimate of initially of what moderate COVID containment um, would, the impact of that would be uh, in our social sector was a loss of 15 and a half million jobs, out of which 10 million would be daily, wa daily wage workers. And to counter this a looming, uh, you know, social crisis, the government announced various fiscal and monetary stimulus packages to ease the pressure on workers, on the economy, and to prevent a slump. Now, colleagues from Cantor will discuss the results of this survey. I think it's useful to highlight the potential gains from the measures taken by the private and the public sector, forced all the worst impact. Now, as you know, financial inclusion is measured as the proportion of adults that have an account in their name with a full service financial institution. And Pakistan is one of the 47 countries in the world with a public strategy, a committed strategy around financial inclusion. Um, and this consists of a complete defined set of goals and action points assigned to different stakeholders including financial institutions, donors, government agencies, and regulators. The first pillar of this strategy is payment and digital transaction services, which is also the focus area of the government. <clears throat> this agenda aims for 65 million active digital accounts, out of which 20 million by 2023 will be held by women. Now, with the high cell phone penetration in Pakistan, 80%, high broadband usage, 41%, and a regulator-driven system, and a regular, regulator committed to making the system work, Pakistan should make big inroads in the coming years. Um, digital is really, as we'll see, uh, it's, it's a way of, one of Pakistan's biggest problems today is a banking system that is shrinking in real terms relative to GDP, one of the smaller banking systems anywhere in the world. And one of the reasons for this, one of the biggest reasons is the huge amount of cash in circulation relative to the size of our deposits, six and a half trillion compared to 16 trillion, uh, six and a half trillion rupees compared to 16 trillion rupees of deposits. Uh, digital will unlock, will pull some of this cash. We hope a lot of this cash into the formal banking system, which through the multiplier will then make available a much bigger base of banking deposits to finance growth, to, to leverage opportunity um, and expand the, 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 the you know, potential size and the potential impact of the banking sector on development, which up to now really has been lagging compared to a um, our peers in South Asia and elsewhere. And, and in that sense, it is you know, absolutely critical that we succeed uh, with digital finance. Now, Cantor's surveys uh, will validate the progress we've made. We'll see that increase in financial inclusion was led chiefly by an increase in mobile money adoption. And that increase uh, in the incidence of mobile ownership by women has led to a rapid increase in their financial inclusion. So this financial inclusion has very rich potential. For example, a massive 2.6 million remittances worth about 15 billion rupees in Pakistan are cash-based. It's cash in, cash out. If we can digitize this and capture these flows um, through digitize, digitization where they are kept on the phone and then payments are made from the phone, this obviates, obviates the need really to hold much cash so that of this remittance flow, a majority now should be held in bank, in bank deposits, uh, not in cash. And, and this, this can be transformation. 
Among the initiatives the government has introduced reforms that include a reduction in the cost of national services, the introduction of tax concessions for branches, banking agents, promotion of government to uh, person payments, G2P uh, payments, cash transfers, salaries, pensions through bank accounts, and the drafting of digital banking regulations, which are available on the State Bank website for public comment. One initiative we must note is a key public-private sector initiative named RASC, which has been the result of a four-year collaboration between the State Bank and Karantas, with financial support provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Some of the key features of RASC are the interoperability between various um, uh, between the whole universe of people making digital payments. So besides banks, you know, fintechs, microfinance companies, um, uh, <clears throat> microfinance banks, microfinance institutions, the entire universe of people who are using digital services for phones. Interoperability means you can debit and credit across uh, the whole spectrum of institutions that are operating payments. Uh, so interoperability, open API-based connectivity, real-time settlements, a directory function, and all this ensures high throughput. Now, given the volume of these transactions, the cost of transactions should come down, and uh, prices, therefore, should reduce given the volume. And this will encourage low-value transactions so that Small payments can also transfer to digital. Now, this, uh, this critical infrastructure created by us ensures that low-cost transactions through a uh, real-time payment system can potentially create and sustain a shift in the adoption of digital finance services, and we hope this will come out in the survey's findings. The use cases that RAS will tap into will have spillover effects that will enable financial institutions to cross-sell their products. For example, in the upcoming stages of its deployment, the pl plans are to route social payments of SRs, public sector salaries, and profits on national saving accounts through the system. Once government G2P, government to person payments, are moved to the system, they open the, pa they open the pathways to other business to person, person to business, and person-to-person -person use cases, such as um, offering insurance and loans and saving-related opportunities. Another key holder in, financial inclusion, in the financial inclusion space is the fintech sector. This has real potential to increase uh, penetration of formal financial services, not only through instant real-time payments, but also through financing, making available finance and investment opportunities in the form of crowdfunding and person-to-person -person initiatives aimed towards the unbanked. And this will be achieved by using technologies such as big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. Fintechs are in a position to provide, provide low-cost, instant access, and user-friendly financial services in a safe, secure, and transparent way. Uh, SECP has strengthened regulations for private equity and venture capital pairs, and a new definition for startups is being prepared, is in the offing. This will strengthen the financial and fintech ecosystem and in turn increase the incidence of financial inclusion as more products, services, and delivery channels become available to uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid. It's worth mentioning that 2020 was a very successful year for fintechs in terms of fundraising. Uh, they raised a total of $12.6 million for new initiatives, which, uh, and this is under the new strengthened private equity venture capital regulations uh, produced by the SECP. And this is the highest that Pakistan has received in a calendar year. The estimate for, for the amount, the estimate for what will go into the fintech sector in the coming years in terms of investments is really open-ended. It is quite, quite significant. As you might have seen, Amazon is now going to allow um, Pakistan to become part of its network. So buying and selling goods from into Pakistan or from Pakistan is going to become easier. And this, this is the kind of sort of uh, ecology that, that digital create for us 
that open open huge opportunities. <laughs> now, it would be remiss to talk about enabling public policies and private sector led reform without em emphasizing the importance of data. Data is critical. It provides benchmarks and it provides a measurable set of goals against which progress can be evaluated. Indeed, the rich data from the COVID survey administered and analyzed by Cantor has enabled today's discussion to have uh, tangibility and significance. In addition, it has also conducted, Cantor has also conducted six, it conducted six waves of the financial inclusion insight survey that can enable cross-sectional as well as trend in money and other financial services. To complement demand side, demand side data, there is also uh, supply side data collection put out by SACP, State Bank, World Bank, and the Ministry of Finance. In this connection, I think it's important to highlight and acknowledge the very effective work done by Karandas, uh, the Karandas Knowledge Management Team in creating a data a portal which is a one-stop shop and a 360-degree data repository that has uh, varied in a diverse information from the areas of microfinance, agriculture, housing, and national economic statistics, among others. I'd encourage all stakeholders, researchers, and academics to acquaint themselves with this very versatile and free of charge portal available on Karandaz's website. Now, as of December 19, Pakistan had reached 65 million wallet accounts with 60% active and unique and surpassed, in fact, it's a gold set for six of a gold set for 65 million accounts by 2023. However, there's still a long way to go. Compared to its, peer, uh, compared to its peers, Pakistan has only 1.3 electronic transactions per capita compared to 16 in Indonesia, 21 in India. And further, each, uh, the share of e-banking channels is still only a meager 8%. And only 16% of government pay payments and receipts are digitized. It is estimated that the broad catalytic impact of the achievement of NFIS goals will add five and a half billion dollars to the GDP and create three million jobs. Widespread use of digital payments alone could lead to a significant increase in the country's GDP, mobilize 250 billion dollars in deposits and create four million jobs. More importantly, adoption of digital channels will formalize, make official a big proportion of Pakistan's predominantly cash economy, shadow economy, which I talked about earlier. Now, before I, uh, I conclude, I'd like to take, to take a quick moment to thank Mr. Sohail Javed from the State Bank, who is representing the State Bank today. He's taken time out of his busy schedule to attend this event. I um, should mention that he was instrumental in the concept, conceptualization and execution of RAS. The Pakistan's instant payment system, interoperative payment system that we talked about a minute ago. Now, also, we must acknowledge that the central bank has been unusually uh, embracing of, of um, digital progress, and it's never shied away from working closely with financial sector stakeholders, always strive to provide a nurturing environment through its policies. And with leaders like Mr. Sohail at the help, we can be assured that this support will continue. I thank you very much for this opportunity of talking to you today. And I look forward to a productive <clears throat> discussion as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raza, for highlighting the effects of the pandemic on our social sector and uh, discussing the results of the survey and the significance of the data it presents. Uh, and also for highlighting the importance of uh, digital finance in the region. Uh, thank you for also mentioning the government's initiatives in, the, in this regard. Uh, I would now like to request Mr. Sohail Javad to please deliver the key address. Uh, during his more than 20 years at SBB, Mr. Javad has held various roles in technology and automation, policy regulations and supervision, treasury and market development. Uh, during his time in State Bank, Mr. Javad has led key national payments and digital financial services infrastructure projects, uh, including core banking system in SVP, RTGS, and RAS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Sunil Javad. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Arij. And uh, 
I hope my my uh, voice is clear, and I'll uh, I'll not take a lot of time. I'm being cognizant of the the time restrictions that we have. Uh, so let me start. Uh, Honorable Salim Raza Saab, uh, Director of uh, Board of Directors of uh, Karandas, and uh, uh, Mr. Bakhasul Hassan, CEO of Karandas, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, uh, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of uh, today's forum on uh, sharing the findings of the survey on impact of COVID-19 on financial behavior in Pakistan. Uh, I would like to thank Karandas Pakistan for inviting SBB to this very important event and congratulate them on the release of the survey findings. Uh, today, I would try to reflect briefly on state banks' policy objectives, uh, impact of COVID-19, and more importantly, the role of digitization and why we see digitization as an important tool in, uh, in addressing the issue of financial exclusion uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, and you, uh, I hope you are aware that financial inclusion and digitization of banking and payments are two uh, very important policy objectives of, uh, of State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, in 2015, uh, SBP issued a comprehensive policy called the National Financial uh, Strategy, uh, which was mentioned by Salim Reza Saab also. Uh, the strategy was aimed at uh, improving the status of financial inclusion in the country. It set ambitious financial inclusion targets at multiple levels. The strategy was again revised in 2019 with revised targets, and it set key drivers such as rapid and sustained expansion of digital transaction accounts, digital financial services, and complete digitization of all government, and pay, uh, government payments and receipts by year 2023. Uh, under the enhanced uh, NFIS, the government of Pakistan and state bank prioritized women's financial inclusion by setting a target of 20 million uh, active uh, uh, women-owned digital transaction accounts by 2023. Now, as you, you might be aware, we are at uh, the bottom rung as far as uh, women financial inclusion is concerned. The rate of financial inclusion uh, of women is, is really low in Pakistan, and that's one of the major concerns for state bank. Uh, right now. Uh, to address this issue, State Bank released a banking on equality policy in December 2020. And this policy uh, is still, it's proposed and they are proposed uh, policy measures. They are based on five pillars. Uh, the first pillar is uh, how we can uh, gender, uh, improve the gender diversity uh, in financial institutions and their access points. Uh, second is uh, how we can have more women-centric products and services uh, in the financial sector. Uh, third is how we can identify and uh, uh, bring forward women champions at all touch points. Uh, fourth is, uh, uh, and it's very important, uh, how we can have robust gender disaggregated data, how we can collect it and how we can disseminate it. And based on that data, how we can formulate policy and set our targets. Uh, and of course, the fifth, fifth one is, uh, uh, having a policy forum on, on gender. So uh, this policy is cross-cutting uh, in nature, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, we will, by, by implementing this policy, we'll be able to include uh, more women in our financial sector and, you know, be able to have them uh, play a better role uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the financial services of the country. Uh, addressing Women financial exclusion problem is very important if we have to tackle poverty. And uh, we believe that uh, enabling women to play a proactive role in our economy is the way forward for Pakistan in becoming a progressive and, and, a, and a developed country uh, in the comedy of uh, nations. Uh, we are also, uh, so let me talk about digitization, why it is important and why it is important in our fight against financial exclusion. So if we look at the problem of financial inclusion, uh, we can see that one of, the, uh, one of the parameters of this problem, one of the variables is access to financial services. Uh, in our country, especially women, uh, you know, they have issue of access, they, they, they have mobility issues and they have, they have restricted uh, in accessing these financial services. So we believe that technology and digitization of payments and services is really important. This is the uh, let me use the word. I think it's the silver bullet uh, for for our for our many of our, of our issues uh, relating to financial inclusion uh, in the country. Uh, COVID nineteen uh, 
uh, last year, we, uh, when when uh, it, it started happening, State Bank took a number of uh, steps to to address the the damage uh, and to control the damage being done by COVID-19. We, we issued financing to save jobs and in where we issued financing for health sector. But one of the uh, uh, one of the steps uh, that we took was that we waived all transactional fees on interbank fund transfers in Pakistan. So that included interbank fund transfers by one link, by SBP's own RTGS systems. And that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that it had a very good impact on the overall uh, adoption of financial services in Pakistan. And we have seen encouraging growth in the space of digital banking and payment transactions during the past uh, year. So uh, in the, if you look at the data that was released by State Bank of Pakistan in the second quarter, which is October to December 2020, we witnessed a strong growth in e-banking and around 300 million, uh, 297 million to be specific, uh, transactions, e-banking transactions were conducted. They valued around more than 24, 21 trillion rupees. And these transactions were done in just in one quarter, which is October to December 2020. We are also seeing a massive uptake in internet and mobile banking transactions. And we are seeing that digital means are facilitating people in conducting their, their transactions. Uh, what has also happened is that we are seeing uh, 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 the emergence of new businesses run by young people, uh, many of them women, many of them uh, very professional uh, women, and they are, they are coming forward to offer uh, their services. This is in line with the national payment system strategy that we issued in 2019, which actually identifies six pillars. And one of the, uh, these six pillars are, uh, they pertain to how we can digitize government payments, how we can digitize and facilitate retail payments, and very importantly, how we can digitize and facilitate remittances. And one of the issues that we are constantly, uh, you know, working on in State Bank is how we can digitize the cross-border remittances. Uh, that that flows into Pakistan and how we can facilitate them. What and how can technology be used to uh, to address uh, challenges here? The other three pillars of our national payment system strategy uh, is how we can improve our own legal and regulatory framework and uh, how we can uh, strengthen our oversight capability and and again very importantly how we can improve the infrastructure uh, in the country. And talking of infrastructure, I'm thankful to Parandas Pakistan and. Uh, where with a under uh, uh, we, we are they are our partners in implementing uh, the Pakistan's uh, instant payment system, which is called RAST. And you must have be aware that the RAST was rolled by the Prime Minister, rolled out uh, in January this year. It's uh, it's uh, a four-year uh, program, uh, as mentioned by Salim Dada Saab. Uh, there are three use cases. So we have done the bulk payments, and we are now working on P2P, and uh, it would be followed by request to pay uh, feature. Uh, which will uh, which will play a very important role in enabling the uh, e-commerce and commerce in uh, in Pakistan. And it will the P2P feature will have a facility called Elias, which would make the sending and receiving of payments very easy. So you can you can send payments using mobile phone numbers to each other. And we hope that this will facilitate further facilitate the adoption of <coughs> digital payments uh, in the in the in the country. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, let me briefly highlight some of the few measures that may not be very much known. Uh, one of the uh, uh, measures that we took in 2019 was the issuance of a, a digital onboarding framework for merchants. And the idea was how we can enable small merchants to uh, open accounts with the banks without actually visiting banks uh, and how we can create an ecosystem whereby the banks can give digital acceptance uh, instruments uh, to these merchants. And our focus uh, is on how the enablement of women merchants, uh, those women who are working from their homes, who are, you know, uh, cooking food, doing uh, uh, drapery word, uh, work, uh, and um, uh, they are giving tuition. So how we can enable them to, that they can accept their payments directly to their wallets and, uh, and their bank accounts. And, uh, a uh, second thing that is uh, that we have been working on is how we can improve the security of digital payments. Because if we don't improve the security of digital payments, we don't bring in trust. And I think one of the other parameters of financial inclusion problem is trust. Uh, if people trust the system, 
uh, they will they will uh, adopt the system. If they don't trust it, of course, they'll go to cash, which is in their hand and uh, seemingly more secure for them, which of course it is not. So uh, we have taken a number of steps, including Im uh, implementation of standards. Uh, and, uh, and I think as a result of those steps, we have seen a good uh, enhancement uh, in the increase in the e-commerce uh, transactions, which is again, a very important use case when it comes to improving uh, financial sector, uh, financial inclusion. One very important thing I think where we are lacking, and I would like to uh, echo what Salim Saab uh, said, is data. Uh, and I think we need to have uh, more gender segregated data and data that could help us in important, uh, in, in making meaningful and uh, uh, important uh, policy uh, interventions. And uh, uh, we, again, we are hopeful that if we have digital service providers, we'll have access to real-time data and we can use that data for the purpose of improving uh, financial uh, inclusion in the country. So in the end, uh, I would again like to appreciate Karandas Pakistan for undertaking uh, this survey and uh, releasing the findings for wider, wider audience. We hope there'll be a lot of commentary on the data and we'll be able to get a lot of insights uh, from data. And I'm sure that today, everybody here would benefit uh, from the findings. Uh, wishing you all a, a very good stay today uh, at the seminar and I hope you will enjoy the rest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Suhail, uh, for highlighting SPP's policies and measures uh, for improving financial inclusion in Pakistan um, and for discussing the issue of women's financial exclusion and SPP's commitment to resolve that. Uh, also for highlighting the importance of digitization for the country. Uh, we will now be moving on to a presentation on the survey by Dr. Samuel Schweth, Research Director at Canter. Dr. Shweth is a social scientist with 15 years of experience leading, monitoring, evaluation, research and learning, the design, implementation and analysis of quantitative and qualitative evaluations uh, in developing countries and fragile states. I would like to welcome Mr. Shweth to please begin the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and just to confirm that uh, this, the presentation is up? Uh, yes, it's up. We can see it. Great. Well, I'd like to just start by thanking Karandas for organizing the presentation of findings. Um, of course, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for sponsoring the Financial Inclusion Insights Program since 2013. Um, and and to all the speakers and panelists and our distinguished um, officials who have uh, so graciously provided uh, comments and and um, and, uh, and you know set these findings in in the important context of policy and the future of financial inclusion in Pakistan. Okay, so just very briefly about the Financial Inclusion Insights Program. Um, it's, it's, this is demand side research. It's about putting the user front and center and, uh, and tracking firstly access to and demand for financial services measures, but also identifying drivers and barriers to, to future adoption of digital financial services. Let's also look at um, mobile money agents and the experience of, of, of interacting with, with mobile money services. And effectively what, what the, the research is designed to do is to produce actionable and forward-looking insights based on rigorous data to support the development of new products and policies to enable financial inclusion globally. Um, so in this presentation, we'll look uh, at, at four sort of key main themes on the impact of COVID-19 on financial inclusion. Um, then we'll dive deeper into digital activities, into the, the financially excluded, and then some economic impacts of uh, the pandemic that we measured on labor and income uh, nationally. Um, so, it, you know, I won't read all of this. This this provides you know some details on the survey methodology. The most important thing to understand is that uh, in March 2020, we were about 60% of the way through 
our wave six, right? So our sixth uh, iteration of the Financial Inclusion Insight Survey in Pakistan, um, when the survey was stopped and, and we had to uh, pull our, uh, our teams out of the field because of the nationwide lockdowns right, implemented to um, slow and, and you know the stop or and stop you know COVID nineteen in that first wave, so so we had to pull the survey out and we quickly realized that um, that the pandemic was going to have you know major effects on the adoption of of digital financial services and financial behaviors um, in general. So we we recognized that. Now, going back to the field sort of after the, the pandemic, after the um, initial lockdown started to be lifting, lifted, right? Going back to the field would, would not, to complete the survey would not really give us comparable data because, you know, the world had just, had just changed. So, um, so we decided to uh, evaluate our findings and, and were able to demonstrate statistically that that 60% of the sample that we achieved um, before the lockdowns that it was in fact nationally representative um, and provided us with, with some high quality statistics uh, at about uh, at um, 3,567 adults who we managed to interview. And, and so then we decided, okay, well, you know, here we are um, now um, at the end of 2020, let's go back to the field and let's re-interview everyone who we, who we uh, surveyed before the pandemic so that we can get a, a real sort of natural experiment where we have a clean baseline pre-pandemic and then compared to what happened almost uh, you know, months later at, as, the, as the, um, the lockdowns were lifted and you know, while we're still in the midst of the pandemic, we have a, we have a, a clear um, picture of, of the effects of the pandemic on financial inclusion. Um, and so in, in the Financial Inclusion Insights surveys, we measure several key indicators and we track these indicators over time. The first one is just general access to financial services. This is our broadest measure of, of usage, right? So this, this doesn't require you to have an account. It's, it's have you ever used um, non-bank financial institutions such as microfinance, um, banks, mobile money services, and, uh, and then sort of combining them all into our, our overall indicator of financial inclusion in sort of the, the fourth chart here. So you can see each of the institutions um, arrayed separately and then in combination uh, sort of across from left to right on, on the chart. And, and, the, um, and so this is giving us the trend from 2015 through the 2020 pre-COVID survey and then the COVID-19 finding in red, right? So that last, that last bar. And you can see that there's really just, you know, a, a big spike in terms of people who have used financial services, um, particularly mobile money, right? So it, it actually, in fact, there's really no change in, in use of, of um, MFIs and other non-bank financial institutions, you know, bank, bank, um, is, is flat, mobile money is really driving this, this change. And so when we look at actual now, you know, zooming down, drilling down into people who have mobile money accounts registered in their name, fully know your customer compliant, we have um, an increase of from 9% of, of adults, right, over the age of 15 is the definition of adults that we use in the survey. So 9% of adults, pre-pandemic to 16% uh, during the pandemic, right? Driving an overall increase in financial inclusion. And this is how we, we define financial inclusion as having an account registered in your own name uh, individually. Defining that is, 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 and so that increased from 21% to 25% of adults as a result of the pandemic, right? In less than a year uh, from March to December, 2020. Um, looking at this by gender, uh, th we did see a, a significant uptick in, uh, in women mobile money registered users uh, from 2% to 6% as a result of the pandemic. Now the growth, you know, in overall percentage, yeah, and obviously that's, that's 3x, right? So that's a tripling in, um, in, in women mobile money users. 
of course, starting from the very low base of only 2% of, of women. Um, you know, the, the percentage among men was, is, is greater, sort of in absolute terms, from 17% to 26% of men uh, adopting mobile money during the pandemic. Um, and then we, we can look at, you know, we can further break these data down by demographics. We can look at, um, and this is now specifically looking at the mobile money uh, data. Um, we can see, you know, breaking down that 16% that of the total population um, by gender, by uh, urban or rural location, and also by, uh, by income, right? So above or below, uh, it's a global $2.50 per day um, poverty line. We can see, you know, that um, all segments, right? All of these demographics were adopting mobile money during the pandemic in a really unprecedented uh, rate. Um, although uh, urban above poverty and men, right, uh, were the, the biggest adopters. Um, now, looking at activity, right? So the, in, in some contexts, we see that there's a lot of unused accounts. Um, in Pakistan, that is not the case, right? We have 16% uh, of the of the population are are active. Um, I'm sorry, 14% of mobile money users reported using their account in the last 90 days, right? And that's only 2% less than the 16% who actually have a registered account. So this is really about you know a very much a demand driven um, adoption process and and you know network effects being what they are as more people adopt digital financial services, the service becomes more useful and therefore I can transfer money or receive money from, from more people in my network. And, and it, this creates this flywheel effect of adoption. Um, so I think we're, what we're looking at here, you know, is a, is a really rapid, um, you know, this economic shock, right, uh, the, the social distancing requirements, the, you know, um, discomfort or, you know, doubts surrounding usage of cash, right, the need to share resources and, and help uh, family and friends through the, the hard times, right, I think all these factors are sort of compounding to really drive this kind of hockey stick graph that we're seeing here, uh, in terms of mobile money adoption, right? Looking back to as recently as 2016, we were only seeing about, you know, really this 0.5% this of the population that was an active user. This was really within this um, survey sampling error, you know, 1% to half a percentage point, you know, that, that has really, you know, just really taken off. So this is, this is a, a, you know, one of these sort of important and, um, you know, positive side effects of this sort of very grim pandemic situation. Um, so looking at impact on, on financial services usage, um, we, we asked people, you know, even though overall adoption of bank accounts didn't increase as a result of the pandemic, we, when we asked people um, in, our, in, our, in the COVID-19 survey at the end of 2020, we asked people, did you use your bank account more often? We saw that that 12% of bank account owners uh, said they used it more often. 37% of mobile money account owners said they used it more often, right? So these are, these are the, those respondents who already had accounts prior to the pandemic, right? Um, you know, 37% used it more often. And then, you know, a fully a third of the population uh, reported receiving remittances from family members during the pandemic and receiving them more often. Looking at some of the digital activities, so here's bank accounts, right? Drilling down into these data, looking at all the different use cases for your bank account, we can see that uh, that uh, bank user activities increased during the pandemic, particularly money transfers, bill pay, and saving, right? So people saved more, you know, consumption was reduced and 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 uh, allocated more to savings. They sent and received money a lot more and bill pay, right, um, it particularly went up. 
uh, you know, we, we saw, uh, and, and really actually everything ticked up at, at least a little bit. Uh, so, so a, you know, usage being really important, obviously, for, for the overall um, capture of, of more funds in the banking system and, and sort of out of the cash economy and being available for capital formation, et cetera, as, as we heard some of the speakers earlier discuss. Um, mobile money, look, you know, we, 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 mobile phone ownership, right, is something that we track closely. We also look at uh, digital behaviors like ability to text, ability to make a financial transaction, downloading apps, um, smartphone ownership, right? Smartphone ownership is, has increased. Overall phone ownership, uh, however, we showed a decrease at the beginning of, of 2020. And we see a kind of a lot of fluctuation in these numbers, um, which is, is, we believe is, is, is an effect to some extent of the of the removal of a large number of, of counterfeit uh, phones, right from from the mobile phone networks. So we did see some kind of you know strange and in, in fact you know frankly fluctuations in the in the mobile phone ownership statistics. Um, but you know we've seen that before in other countries where you know similar types of of um, of anti anti-counterfeit or uh, phone registration requirements um, come into play. And so, you know, we expect, you know, to see in this demand side data, you know, over time it will revert, of course, to the, to match the kind of supply side data that shows, you know, steady expansion of, of phone ownership. A bright point here definitely is, is that we saw a, a, a significant increase in phone ownership among women. Um, from 27% to 37% during the pandemic. At the same time as we saw, you know, somewhat puzzling, right, decrease in phone ownership among men. And, you know, and, and this is probably just due to the kind of the market shock, right, surrounding the, um, the, the removal of, of sort of smuggled phones. Um, on to mobile, you know, quick look at mobile money providers. So our two, you know, dominant mobile money services, MobiLink, Jazz Cash, and Telenor, Easy Pesa, right? We've we've seen, you know, over the years, we've seen a, a steady increase in um, in Jazz Cash uh, users, and and a bit of a decrease, and, and a decrease in in Telenor users. Now that actually reversed during the pandemic. So Telenor saw a significant uptick. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, you know, we have 68% uh, said they used Jazz Cash and 63% said they used um, Telenor, right? We didn't really see um, much change on, on the other, on the other services. So it's, it's looking like, you know, these two market incumbents are, have, have strengthened their, their position. Um, looking at, at now at um, purchasing behavior. We did see definitely the pandemic, you know, sort of confirming, you know, what we see on the supply side data and, and more generally that in, in the news that the pandemic did drive users online and away from cash. And, you know, as we saw earlier on some of the charts around um, bank usage, um, it's really utility bills and other bills as well as, uh, as, well as remittances sending cash um, to each other uh, have, have seen a significant boost. Um, looking at the financially excluded population, you know, you know, this, this difference between the registered users of mobile money on the one hand and, and those who have kind of ever used mobile money, the, the sort of overall user base, you know, the, the, you know, the, the state bank and, and the regulators, you know, have, have been um, you know, made, made quite strong uh, uh, rules around, you know, know your customer regulations and, and how people should not be using mobile money sort of directly with an agent over the counter, you know. Um, and so, you know, over since, since 2015, we really saw no increase in the percentage of people who were using mobile money without having an account. But this actually increased, uh, this ticked up during the pandemic from 8% uh, in, in the early 2020 to 11%. Um, at the end of 2020. So we are seeing, you know, people maybe not quite ready to adopt, to have their own account, right, using someone else's account or, or getting help from an agent to, to receive transfers. Um, some of the income and labor impacts, right, 
We see you know, a, a significant negative effect on household finances. We saw 61% of households reported losing a job or, or some, uh, some, or some of their income. Um, and uh, in, in a, in a, in, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a, a difficult, you know, situation for, for many households um, who, you know, 38% reported having enough money for food, but not clothing and 26% reported having, not having enough uh, for food. Um, we have a, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this, nearly half of adults said their, in, their household income was lower or much lower compared to the pandemic. 39% um, said the pandemic was, was the main reason and 41% said it was a significant factor in, the, in, the, in their uh, decreased income. Um, unemployment, right? We actually saw um, women's employment increase during the pandemic. And overall employment actually increased by seven percentage points, uh, which is, is quite interesting at the same time as, you know, as um, so the economic shock from COVID-19 has pushed more women into the workforce, um, you know, and, and people had to work more, but, but effectively earning less uh, in terms of household income. So, so that, that brings us to the end of the, of the short presentation of findings here. Um, there is a longer report uh, available or that will be available after the webinar. We'll publish it on the finclusion.org website. Um, and the raw data, uh, this is of course anonymized um, uh, for publication. The sort of anonymized um, raw data is, uh, will be available on our website as well on request. And uh, so going to that, uh, to that online form, I'll share the link uh, in the uh, Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Schweth, for such a detailed and insightful presentation on the policies and the future of financial inclusion in Pakistan, uh, and for highlighting the key themes of the economic impacts of COVID-19 on financial behavior. So we have a couple of questions over here that I'd like to address, or I'd like to put forward to you, so you could address them, please. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so the first one is, how representative can we consider these results, considering Karachi was excluded in the survey, both surveys conducted in 2020? Yeah, absolutely. That is, uh, you know, unfortunately, the field teams didn't make it to Karachi before the lockdowns. So, I, you know, my sense and, and you know, others can, can um, give their impressions as well. You know, my sense is that had we included Karachi, we would actually see bigger numbers here. Um, so, so these findings may be somewhat understated um, because Karachi being, you know, such an important financial center, uh, obviously large population center uh, was excluded. So, Yes, the, the, the findings may be somewhat understated. All right, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, can you compare the urban versus rural split for financial inclusion in the survey? Also, what steps do you think can be taken to increase the incidence of the financial inclusion in rural areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, adoption of mobile money uh, in Pakistan and, and globally um, is definitely led by um, urban, you know, relatively wealthy um, men, right? Um, and and those those network work effects, right? That really drive you know adoption. Uh, it, they take time to reach into rural areas. And we, but but we certainly saw here that the the rural adoption uh, was you know, positively impacted by the pandemic. Um, it's you know of course the agents right and the the availability of agents and the 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 strength of the agent networks and their reach into rural communities uh, is really the key for. Um, for, for the growth of digital financial services and mobile money specifically, agent banking as well, um, we, we could discuss. 
Uh, so, so I think, you know, on the one hand, you know, this is certainly driven by network effects in terms of, of remittances and people sending money from cities into relatives in rural areas. Um, but also as these, as these, as the, the network grows, then we see more um, adoption in rural areas and, and connection um, between from rural to rural sort of transfers. All right, thank you. Uh, we will be moving on to the final question. Uh, how should we interpret the six percentage points decline in mobile phone ownership for males, given that the mobile, mobile phone ownership for below poverty segment has gone up by four points? Yeah, very, it, it, you know, there is a lot of, of strange, you know, frankly, the, the, the mobile phone data, you know, is a bit strange and it, it has been affected you know, are you know, having seen, but having seen similar um, fluctuations in, in phone ownership in the context of uh, various regulatory uh, enforcement actions, right, in other countries, we saw, you know, um, similar, the, the, the adoption of the, of the Qualcomm technology, right, that on the mobile phone network identifies a, a, a fake uh, IEMI uh, number, I believe, um, the you know that that understands whether that phone um, in its production complied with intellectual property um, law, right, and was not smuggled and sort of counterfeited, right. So the removal of all of these phones from the market and and, and removal of them from the phone networks, um, we think had you know had this this sort of this it was a shock essentially to the market. And, you know, and, and this is one of the, you know, one of the aspects of surveys, right, where you're relying on respondents to, to, to give you, you know, a, um, a fully transparent answer. And when, when there's this kind of uncertainty around, is my phone legal or not, right, that can also affect, you know, the way that respondents report their, um, their ownership. Um, and, and so, so yeah, so we we saw this, um, you know, but but we did. I think overall, what we'll see as we as we um, you know in the future, as as data come back from phone ownership, I think we'll see you know uh, an in overall increase in phone ownership across the demographics, um, uh, due you know as a as a as a side effect of the pandemic as well, and more phone uh, phone uh, ownership among women. Um, which we saw in the pandemic, as well as as well as poorer people, you know, I expect this to be a, a lasting trend. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schwed, for such a detailed presentation, for taking out the time today and for answering all the questions. Uh, we should now commence a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Ms. Meher Shah and Mr. Ali Akhtar. Ms. Shah is the Director, Knowledge Management and Communications Department at Karandas, and Ms. Takhba is the Manager, Knowledge Management Department. The panel discussion will be on the trends, stickiness, women, and importance of demand sign data. Without any further ado, I request Ms. Shah and Ms. Takhba to please begin the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Reej. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum and good, good afternoon to all. In our panel, we have representatives from International Telecom Association, financial and the development sector. They bring a rich blend of experience and expertise in the space of financial inclusion that will hopefully lead to a very fruitful discussion. We have with us Saad Farooq. He works for the Mobile Money Financial Inclusion Program at GSMA and is based in London. Saad has over 15 years of experience in telecoms, mobile and digital financial services. In his current role with a global remit, Saad represents the interests of mobile operators in the areas of financial inclusion and works closely with stakeholders such as FATF, Interpol, OECD, World Bank, IMF, among others. Our second, second speaker for the day is Mr. Yaya Khan. Yaya is the Chief Digital Officer, Group Head Digital Banking at Bank Al Fala. Yaya has over 25 years of professional experience in local and international organizations such as JP Morgan Chase London, Price Waterhouse Coopers London, Unilever, Engro Chemicals, and ICI Pakistan. Prior to joining Bank Al Fala, Yaya was the head of Easy Pesa and Chief Financial Services Officer at Telenor, where he was responsible for managing 
and scaling up of Pakistan's premier digital banking service. We also have with us Imran Khan. He's an independent financial inclusion expert. Imran um, specializes in the areas of financial inclusion, survey design, and implementation. He has managed all six waves of the FII survey in Pakistan. He's also managed the Agent Net Network Accelerator Survey in 2017. Besides that, he has worked on the demand side of financial inclusion in Pakistan from a variety of angles. Uh, for fourth speaker of the day, we have Rihan Akhtar, who is Chief Digital Officer at Karangaz. Rihan has 19 years of diverse uh, work experience in the fields of segment planning, market research and analysis, and product development. Prior to joining Karandaz, Rihan worked at Telenor Pakistan since 2006 and headed various functions. In his role as director B2B uh, at Telenor, he transformed traditional post-paid focused B2B teams to a holistic business unit and created unique propositions for business customers combining GSM. Joining Rihan is Amna. She works uh, in Rihan's team. Uh, she is the gender advisor at Karandaz Digital. Before joining Karandaz, Amna has been working with UNDP's Merged Areas Governance Project in the capacity of a program manager. Prior to that, she's worked with um, uh, small and medium enterprise activity USAID on CLUDE as women-led enterprises specialists. She has also worked as Women's Economic Empowerment Specialist with AusAid Market Development Facility. So we will now turn to the panelists and pose them two questions each. Uh, now, I, we would be grateful if they could limit the responses to two to three minutes per question. I will begin with Saad, who's representing GSMA. So Saad, how are mobile financial services contributing to financial inclusion in Pakistan? Thank you, Ali. Thank you for having me here. Uh, globally, mobile financial services are creating a significant impact on financial inclusion. There are currently 310 live mobile money services in 96 countries, uh, serving 1.2 billion registered mobile money accounts. In December 2020, about $23 billion was circulating in the MFS digital ecosystem globally. Now, coming to Pakistan, state banks enabling policy frameworks have encouraged private sector investment in digital financial services, which is helping drive financial inclusion, especially in rural areas where banking penetration has typically been low. Um, as a result, Pakistan also now has better market and technical infrastructure to support financial inclusion than many other countries. This, for example, includes national ID database, a privately owned switch, which enables interoperability between banks and non-bank financial service providers. However, uh, based on CGAP's research, the financial inclusion drive could be further strengthened to increase the number of accounts in Pakistan compared to the regional peers. While State Bank of Pakistan, we believe, has rightly put in place the necessary ingredients for increased financial inclusion, there are two main issues. The first is a little bit of conservative approach to certain products, example, digitizing international remittances through the mobile channel. And the second is an overall perceived lack of customer trust. Um, as Salim Raza Sahib mentioned, digitizing international remittances in Pakistan could play an important role in bringing more people in the financial inclusion net. Globally, the mobile money industry is digitizing over a billion dollar a month in remittance transactions. Um, and, and according to the World Bank, mobile money remittances are the cheapest form of sending remittances uh, across the globe, 47% cheaper than other channels. Um, I, we believe that, you know, uh, this is something that, that could further strengthen the financial inclusion in Pakistan, giving access to more and more people in the rural areas. Coming to my second point on the lack of trust, currently, you know, the mobile money sector is, uh, is dominated by two main mobile money providers, Jazz Cash and Telenor Easy Pesa, as we saw in Dr. Samuel's presentation. Um, what are they doing? They're investing heavily in financial literacy campaigns to educate customers directly and, and, and via their agents to build trust in mobile financial services. Operators are also innovating by adding more digital services uh, to encourage customers to move away from the cash culture. 
Jazz Cash, for example, added about 100,000 active merchants in 2020, um, and collectively they're processing more payments than, than banks um, on a monthly basis. Um, the GSMA is supporting uh, the industry overall um, to, to increase financial inclusion. In this regards, we, run, uh, we are running uh, an international program which we call the MFS certification that underpins sustainable financial inclusion. It requires mobile money providers to, to comply with close to 300 detailed international best practices um, to build customer trust, which again would be very helpful to, you know, to counter the lack of trust in Pakistan um, and fight fraud as well as issues of national importance such as money laundering and terrorism financing. Um, certified operators include big, big brands like Safaricom, um, Kenya, Orange, Vodafone, MTN, etc. Um, and, 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 you know, last point, I know we're running short of time uh, before I, I close on this point is, you know, as a result of COVID-19, we've seen regulators in many countries uh, working with MFS providers to zero rate transactions. Initially, you know, we've seen a big surge in financial inclusion in, in, in mobile money usage, but in certain parts of the world, we've seen that the trend started to reverse because operators couldn't financially sustain that model. And later regulators had to make the adjustments to ensure that financial um, inclusion did not reverse to financial exclusion. So we, we potentially see this as, as a concern in Pakistan with regards to financial inclusion, but I won't say much more because we're already, we, we are in the process of carrying out a research um, and we'll be publishing our findings later on. Um, so that's all from my side on the first question. Uh, thanks, sir. Um, following up on this, there's a very um, interesting development in the area of 5G in Pakistan. The government has announced that the technology will be introduced towards the end of 2022, I think. So what impact do you think that will have on the incidence of DFS and financial inclusion in general? I think that, that that is a very important and interesting development. You know, the GSMA expects by that by 2025, 5G networks are likely to cover one third of the world's population um, and the impact on mobile industry and its customers will be profound. So I think a very good development in Pakistan, but I think we need to understand that 5G is, is more than you know, a new generation of technology. It denotes a new era in which connectivity will become increasingly fluid and flexible. Uh, 5G networks will adapt to applications and performance uh, that are tailored precisely to the needs of the users. Um, and so financial, if 5G technology will certainly change the nature of financial services across the globe and, and in Pakistan also. Uh, the GSM is working closely with mobile operators pioneering 5G, um, engaging with governments, vertical industries, including financial services to develop new use cases. You know, I think we need to understand that at this point in time, 5G is very new um, and the use cases that exist are primarily at industry level, you know, whether that's uh, you know, remote medical procedures, or that's, you know, smart cities, etc. cetera. Um, when we believe that, you know, 5G will become a general purpose technology for, for financial services firms in Pakistan, as it provides ultra reliable and, and low latency communications, um, and, and also leading to new possibilities to create, store and protect uh, value and then move money and to access credit. We also expect 5G to set the tone for the transformation of financial services sector by accelerating data-driven financial services offerings and in intensifying competition um, in the financial services sector in Pakistan. Um, this would also likely lead to, to the further rise of fintech. I know the State Bank of Pakistan is working uh, to have more and more EMI players, which obviously you know, includes fintech. So I think overall, the uh, State Bank of Pakistan is doing a, a, playing a key role in, in, in setting the right direction and the way for more innovation and competition in 5G. I think the full impact of 5G will be felt in the years to come. Uh, so the players in, in the financial services ecosystem should start gearing up to benefit from the opportunity. Thank you. Right, Mayor, do you want to take Yaya? Yes, thank you, Saad, for such detailed, detailed responses. Uh, Yaya, can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot there. Uh, I think we, we uh, shared the detailed survey with you quite recently, but um, based on what you have seen in the last year, you know, in, in Bank Al-Fala, 
uh, do you think that these results that we've seen, which are coming out to be very, very positive in the survey, you know, increase in the number of women who are interacting with the financial sector and just generally the, the you know, improved utilization of bank accounts, of mobile money. Do you see this as something which is sustainable? Is it going to stick? Or was this just a positive blip which uh, is going to vanish as COVID recedes? Yeah, so, um, so thank you. So um, I think as has been talked about uh, that um, given the unfortunate situation of COVID, but one of the beneficiaries uh, of this situation has been the digitization overall, whether it's in uh, health or education or financial services. Um, so certainly at our bank also, um, we have seen the similar trends which have been seen across all mobile money players as well as uh, across the commercial banks. Uh, we have seen our uh, digital transactions a growth of over 100%, a growth of over 300% in our payment gateway transactions, growth of over 1600% on our e-commerce marketplace. And those trends are similar and the rest of the market has, uh, has seen similar trends. Look, the, the, the principle of digitization is that uh, customers have got to try out uh, the user friendliness, the user experience, the convenience of digitization a few times before they become a hooked on customer. Uh, even when the times were good, that was the principle that most mobile money players and commercial banks applied for digitization. Generally, it has been talked about between three to five times that they've got to try a certain service before they get hooked on uh, and, and not go back. Uh, given the amount of time that this, this uh, unfortunate crisis has taken, customers have now gotten used uh, to it. And we, we monitored it as, as the, the, there was a gap between the first wave and the second wave, and then the gap between the second wave and the third wave, and then things were started to, to normalize. We were very closely monitoring that how many dropouts do we actually see? And we didn't see any significant number. In fact, the growth trend continued um, even during those periods. So, so I don't feel the answer to your direct question is, I don't think uh, that uh, there's going to be a significant drop. Perhaps the growth is going to taper. We may not see as much growth. The key here is, however, uh, that I think that during this time of stress, um, uh, there is a responsibility on mobile money players and commercial banks to continue to digitize the actual real use cases for the customers um, and, and not just be limited to what we were actually doing pre-pandemic because now customers need real use cases of banking services to be resolved, that of their savings, their borrowings, uh, their wealth management uh, issues. To that respect, um, we must also bear in mind uh, that the all physical touch points are going to continue to be under stress uh, while this situation continues. That includes bank branches. They might be reducing, they might be operating with reduced number of branches or limited times as we, we are actually about to see in the upcoming uh, holiday period also. And the same pressure would also be applied ultimately, either directly or indirectly to mobile money agents. So directly, they might also be shut because the marketplaces are going to be shut and indirectly because they rely on bank branches to manage their own cash and, 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 and hence they would also be limited. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think the ecosystem needs to continue to play its part, but from the consumer's point of view, I don't think the, we, we are going to see a significant drop in the adoption. Okay, that is great to know. So um, how do you think Bank al Fala will respond to the findings of this survey? What are two findings which, you know, from this survey, which really kind of stand out for you and, and make for actionable research for the bank? Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, so I think the, uh, and, and we have also seen that in our case that the, the use of, uh, digital banking on small screen is upwards of 90%. Uh, and the large screen 
uh, only has less than 10% usage. So, so we continue to focus on smartphone. We continue to focus on, on small screen. We continue to focus on uh, the users who are carrying those uh, small screen devices and the availability of data uh, to those customers, because these are the two, in, two important ingredients for the consumers to, 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 to continue to use the banking services, which are defined as essential services. To that respect, obviously, the whole ecosystem has to work together and no one industry can work in isolation. Uh, so the handset prices, they have come down in recent past, must continue to come down. Uh, the availability of 4G network, which uh, the, the banking services, the digital banking services rely significantly on must continue to be accessible as well as um, we are seeing a tremendous amount of load now on the 4G services and the availability of spectrum and bandwidth. And once again, banking is an essential service. So there, there has got to be certain priority uh, mechanism that the, the banking services must continue to be accessible over the rest of the social media services, for example. And I continue to say this thing. As for our part, Look, um, we would continue to digitize uh, all uh, payment transactions, be it dis payment through disbursements, be it payment through international remittance, which is heard from the previous, uh, from Saad, uh, be, be, it, uh, be it direct point of sale, proximity payments or online payments. So we would continue to digitize all those payment transactions. We also heard earlier from the regulator that, uh, and we believe that, uh, the, the pricing for these payment transactions would continue to be under stress, either as a result of market dynamics or through the regulatory interventions. So now it's incumbent upon the banks to try and find the means where they're actually creating value for their own shareholders. And that value rests in, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, in providing deposits, uh, deposit products, as well as uh, lending or digital lending services, uh, which depend on uh, on on their ability to uh, to to digitize the data and use the data and come up with digital credit algorithms so that's what we'll be also working on great thank you so it looks like we will have some early takers hopefully for the new framework that's expected on the digital banking regulations let's hope so great thank you yaya thank you um, we'll turn to Imran now. Um, Imran, so Intermedia and now Kantar has been collecting demand side data on financial inclusion for the past five to six years and generating valuable insights for both private and public sector. Can you talk about the importance of demand side data in furthering the financial inclusion goal? I would also like to talk you, uh, for you to talk about um, the the outlay on resources uh, that is required in demand side data. There's a significant outlay required in terms of financial and human resource allocation. Okay, and thank you, Ali. Uh, I mean, one thing about demand side surveys is that it is more than just the headline number. So a lot of the time you look at like the demand side results and it's only the level of financial inclusion is discussed. And for that, I think, State Bank has done a great job in terms of uh, the, uh, now providing us an estimate of the total number of unique accounts and hopefully they will come up with an estimate for active accounts as well. And that will be a much more reliable uh, assessment. Demand side data, I think, is more about the nuance and on the demand side that what makes a person uh, opt for a financial account, right? Like a, a formal financial account. So we heard about the, the, the gender gap uh, in terms of CNIC registrations, there is gender gap in terms of mobile uh, phone ownership as well. But then at the same time, as per the 2020 estimate, 89% of female uh, mobile phone owners are financially excluded. So why, I mean, you talk about all the social norms and all of that, why is that adoption not happening? So I mean, for all of these sort of questions, the demand side uh, surveys are, are very important. And uh, I think, as, as you mentioned, the financial uh, resources that are needed, when we talk about the government uh, sector, I mean, State Bank has done uh, the access to finance surveys uh, and they are very helpful, but then they come with a cost. And uh, I'll be out on a limb here, but government departments uh, of across, I mean, it's a third world country in the end. So 
this is sort of an expense that mostly uh, your government departments are not ready to invest in. So that's where I think the uh, the donor community has sort of come in and with the FinDEX as well as the FII, it has painted that picture, especially with FII, 2013 to 2020 has been a very dynamic uh, sort of phase for Pakistan when it comes to mobile uh, money, how OTC to wallet transition has happened, uh, brand awareness is increasing, awareness about the functionality of uh, uh, mobile money is increasing. So all of that is sort of documented, those perceptions are documented and they, they have a lot of uh, policy lessons uh, in, uh, in that. Uh, yeah. Okay, following up, um, PBS and the government itself collects a lot of uh, survey data. Um, demand side survey data. What questions do you think uh, can we add to any of these survey, uh, any of these surveys to uh, sort of uh, build upon what the private sector is doing? Yeah, I think uh, one uh, really uh, good survey that uh, that can have a whole financial inclusion module is the PSLM survey uh, done by the I mean, the Federal Bureau of Statistics. And uh, why I say that is because one, uh, they, every alternate year, they go at the district level. So this whole, the financial exclusion bit, I mean, we, uh, FII goes to the provincial level, right? So digging deep is where the real nuance is. Like you look at uh, your voter registration statistics and see, I see ownership and you see, I mean, there are like, with, at the district level, there are a lot of nuance within each province. So the PSLM then gives us that opportunity where we can actually go in the, 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 the latest PSLM, which is at the provincial level, they've included an ICT module. So for the first time, I mean, I hope they repeat that when they do the district level survey. So you, you will have an estimate of, uh, in terms of mobile phone ownership at the district level and also usage. There, there are some quite interesting questions as to why you are not using uh, ICT and like why you're not using uh, computers and laptops and we need that uh, that information at the district level to really uh, uh, sort of zoom in on where the those pockets are uh, um, and currently I mean even with these demand side uh, surveys I mean because that would be a huge exercise if or uh, for FII to go to the district level I mean sample size would, would be huge and it would be a huge undertaking so just to sort of uh, use the existing resources that the government is doing. I mean, adding one module wouldn't be uh, that big an, uh, an issue for, for PBS. Then an, another uh, uh, survey is the labor force statistics survey. So the labor force statistics survey is also something that, uh, that keeps on uh, repeating. And there is a module where they ask uh, the respondents about how they are getting their uh, earnings. So, I mean, that is prime for then asking them whether they are getting through a formal source. If they're not getting it through a formal source, then what are the reasons that they're not getting it for a formal source? And also in terms of the account ownership. So sort of, th these are like a, a few uh, uh, areas where uh, this, this could be like um, sort of modules could be, and the FII then provides the questions. So uh, you have the questions that are coming from 2013, they're tried and tested. So even if those questions are used, I mean, there sub, could be some comparability. Obviously, there are sampling issues and all, but still there could be some com a comparability in terms of the way the questions have been framed and it would be like a continuation of this, uh, uh, the efforts that have been done so far. Excellent. So what you're saying is we can, the pro we can always piggyback off of the government surveys and the survey protocols and processes that are already in place. And um, if there's a joint effort between the private and the public sector, we can save a lot of time, effort, and money. Yep, definitely. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. The, the question uh, that we have for you is uh, that in partnership with uh, the State Bank of Pakistan, Karandas has launched uh, a game-changing initiative, um, which is called RAST. Now, RAST has the potential to revolutionize the payments landscape. Can you explain how it will accomplish this with a specific focus on high volume, low value use cases? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayak, for the question. I just want to technically correct uh, 
Karandal has not launched, State Bank has launched. We have supported State Bank for this initiative. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to add to Imran's comment on surveys. I think there's also this gold mine with Benizit uh, SAS uh, program has, which is the National Social Economic Registry. And although it's a, it's something, you know, data which is kept within SRS for targeting, but uh, what I understand is, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a gold mine of information about households and trends. And it will be very interesting to see financial inclusion, questions being put part of it. And because here, you know, I, I think also to acknowledge that HBL and Bank Alpha is also embarking on trying to introduce full mandate accounts to, you know, these beneficiaries, which can actually lead to a new sort of wave uh, of change, and especially because these are uh, these are women. Matt, coming back to your question. Uh, so if, if you look at even the financial uh, insights and then slide number 15, which talks about the activities of the bank account owners, uh, you know, the three activities which, which, you know, pop up. So the top one is send or receive money, uh, which is on a very high level. Uh, and then there's another one, which is, have you ever paid a government tax uh, or fee or have you received payment from the government, which is, which is quite low. And then in the middle, you know, there are things like, uh, have you made a payment, uh, merchant payment, etc. So RAS basically essentially is an interoperable payment system. And I wish, you know, the survey could also have captured that while people reported that they sent money, more money than they usually did, but did they send money to a different bank or did they actually send money to the same bank? Because that is the real enablement that RAS brings in, the interoperable payments. And I think it will also be interesting to see that the increase, how much was it sort of uh, uh, fueled by the price uh, that was mandated by central bank and how much was it actually pushed by because people could not go out and it was just uh, a need to actually make a payment and that sort of convinced them to try, you know, something that Yaya, Yaya also talked about, you know, initiate a trial. Was it the price or was it actually the uh, lack of availability of an agent or, or, or issue at the agent or the, or, or the bank branches? So how RAS basically enables and fits into all of this is, so the three primary use cases that it enables. One is uh, the payments from the government. And we know that uh, there are large scale uh, use cases uh, in which government needs to conduct business with, with citizens. Uh, Benefit income support is one, uh, there are government salaries, pensions, uh, there's also natural savings. You know, all of these institutions uh, interact with millions of Pakistanis, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. And if you look at the strata of this uh, uh, population, you know, most of them belong to the middle class. If not excluded, they definitely are the middle class. But if you look at the SAS beneficiaries, all of them are actually uh, excluded. So one thing that RAS enables is to connect these key government institutions more efficiently uh, more real-time basis, you know, uh, with, with, with the banks. The other use case which it's going to enable is the P2P use case, uh, also known, also used as uh, sending money to another account, and that's where I sort of also hinted that I think we should also look at uh, underneath the statistic that there is an increase. <clears throat> but if there is a real increase because of interoperability being promoted, I think that's a real win for Pakistan. Uh, we already have these large uh, closed loop, uh, sort of closed loop systems, uh, easy pass and jazz cash, where it is free. It was always free to send money to another account in jazz cash and easy pass and vice versa. So within the account, within the bank, but in real terms, uh, interoperability comes into play. If you can send with the same convenience, with the same experience, <clears throat> with the same price, you know, if the, if the user does not have to discriminate, and that's you know something. Uh, so as I've also talked about, you know, a directory functionality which will be launched, which will actually help create an alias. So you could actually pay on an alias rather than a very complex uh, account number. And the third use case that RAS will enable is the merchant payments. Uh, now, merchant universe is very, very huge. <clears throat> so from a local Karyana, Telewala, 
to you know hire sort of uh, uh, more formal organized sort of merchants and of course you know uh, there are different solutions for different segments so for very high end retail maybe card will still remain the most relevant solution but for a more common uh, you know the 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 corner shop and the smaller shops uh, even sort of the ready wala uh, what we have seen in some of the countries is the explosive use of qr code and what you do is you just make a qr code transaction and the payment is actually done you know there and then uh, so we're hoping uh, that when ras inshallah launches this use case as well so there will be uh, a significant um, you know adoption uh, there and then you know uh, there are some other features as well that uh, ras will enable I'll, i'll not go into that but these are three use cases that ras will enable in a true form and create an interconnected ecosystem of digital payments where if you are initiating payment from emi or a bank or a mobile uh, account there will be no discrimination you could get access to immediate transfer of funds which will be final and the 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 i think there was a discussion by sad about the trust so this also then will improve the trust of people uh in the in the in the overall ecosystem and we hope that this will also lead to people opening formal bank account uh, because the value perception of the digital financial services will uh, will improve great thank you rehan uh, now we turn to the gender expert on our panel uh, so amna the findings show that the gender gap in financial inclusion is the same as before covid at a whopping 29 percentage points given that uh, karandas digital has a gender focus as well how do you think it will respond to this finding and uh, what sort of uh, bearing can we expect on the existing initiatives that karandas digital is undertaking and maybe how will you plan for the new ones in light of this uh, finding uh, thank you for that question um uh, it's unfortunate that the gender gap is so high and it's quite high compared to other developing countries or neighboring countries as well so we take the statistics very seriously um however having said that i think one encouraging thing in the report was that uh, women's financial inclusion increased by 4% during covid and men's inclusion also increased by 4% during the same time period so we did see some improvements but then that also points out that there are such strong uh, structural inequalities that uh, don't allow addressing of that gender gap uh, right away and uh, for this reason we are uh, carrying out a couple of interventions we do have a couple of initiatives that uh, focus on addressing these inequalities and on reducing the gender gap as well uh so our work is divided into our uh, private sector initiatives and public sector initiatives uh so on the private sector side we do have a dedicated uh, challenge fund round called FIWC uh, in which we specifically looking for uh, interventions and solutions that help to improve uh, women's financial inclusion uh so we work in partnership with uh, financial institutions but then we also work in partnership with other businesses Uh, that that link women to formal um, financial services and also create uh, economic opportunities and employment opportunities for women and also women based out of their homes uh, at the same time we also have other uh, funding rounds uh, we do experiments we do design thinking programs uh, we do pilots as well and in these we work with financial service providers to tailor the uh, products to better meet the needs of women Uh, our work has shown that if you make changes in messaging and communication and uh, design of the product to understand women's needs then that significantly drives uh, uptake and in- increases the receptibility of women towards that product without uh, adversely affecting the appetite of men for uh, that product uh, so that is something that we do as well uh, we did do a pilot on uh, female roaming agents which was successful and we hope that more financial institutions will be able to take up that model especially because state bank in its gender policy has also given targets to uh, financial institutions regarding the representation of women in the agent networks and also in their sales staff uh moving on to the public sector side uh, we uh, we consciously adopt a gender mainstreaming lens and try to ensure that all of our interventions do address women's inclusion as well because it was said earlier as well that technology can create a divide and can also help address that divide 
so as an example, we are working with national savings. Uh, we are introducing various technological improvements in their processes, and we are actively working to ensure that women also start adopting those uh, technological improvements. And perhaps later we might introduce a newer products uh, focused on women as well. Uh, another thing that we're looking forward to is the uh, potential integration of ESAS uh, with RAST, uh, which means that more women at the bottom of the pyramid will be able to have bank accounts. And at the same time, uh, we are in talks with ESAS on the design of a financial literacy program, which means that women will be able to understand the usage of these accounts and they will be able to uh, access and utilize other uh, financial services as well, leading to financial deepening. And uh, lastly, uh, we do believe that RAS is going to be a game changer. And as mentioned earlier, once people realize the level of trust and uh, convenience that's associated with the system, and once newer use cases become live, uh, then we hope that that would lead to an increase in the account ownership by women. Great, thank you. Uh, this concludes our panel discussion. I think uh, it was a very um, insightful discussion that we had and a lot of interesting ideas were shared by our speakers and panelists. Um, I'll quickly um, summarize uh, um, today's discussion um, uh, what the speakers highlighted and the, what the panelists uh, said. Mm. As far as the survey is concerned, the results are very encouraging. Uh, financial inclusion has increased and that was primarily driven by mobile money. Women financial inclusion has increased and, um, and active users for mobile money have also increased. Now efforts must be made to sustain these positive outcomes. And uh, uh, Yaya touched upon tapping into real use cases. Uh, remittances is a big one. Um, G2B programs such as SAS being the other. Um, we have infrastructure in place. Um, uh, RAST has uh, been launched um, uh, with the efforts of State Bank and Karandas, and now 5G is in the offing. Um, SBP is um, a very encouraging and enabling regulator, supporting uh, the private sector uh, at each and every step. We've learned that data is very important. Uh, uh, we need to continue collecting it, uh, uh, give it the sort of attention that it deserves. Um, and all stakeholders, the government donors and the private sector must make a, a concerted, concentrated, sorry, effort, um, uh, concent uh, concentrated joint effort in this area. Um, Imran identified rich government surveys such as SRS, PSLM and the labor force survey that could perhaps be expanded by including certain questions on financial inclusion. Um, in, in the gender area, uh, Karandas Digital is doing some fantastic work with both private and public sector. Um, it is, uh, in, it, um, Amna mentioned a challenge fund where it solicits innovative solutions in return for financing. Um, it, she also mentioned uh, that they're working with uh, national savings for products focused on women. Um, uh, there was talk of integrating RAST with SRS um, to sort of uh, uh, bring women at the bottom of the pyramid into uh, the formal uh, financial inclusion channels. Um, so um, um, very encouraging on the whole, um, um, more positives than uh, negatives for sure. I will now conclude uh, uh, by acknowledging our speakers, panelists and everyone in the audience uh, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, stay safe uh, and um, secure. Thank you. Just a quick addition on uh, the fact that this survey, the video of uh, today's session is going to be available on our social media platforms, uh, but starting tomorrow. So just wanted to leave that with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you.